I always thought that kind of running a business, you'd you'd do a certain amount and it would be hard work, but you'd reach a plateau and then you'd be kind of coasting along. And it's kind of like every day just realise that things are more nuanced and complex than you thought they were. Episode 102. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week we have part two of the conversation with Dr. Thomas Yarrow and Thomas Miller. And as I remind you that Dr. Thomas Yarrow is the author of Architects Portraits of a Practice. And his book was actually written about his ethnographic study that he conducted in the workshop of Miller Howard or the Miller Howard workshop Um, and in that book which is very insightful into the kind of operations of an architecture practice and it draws upon a lot of very interesting observations about the nature of architecture, how we're able to deal with complexity without things kind of ultimately resolving and it was a great opportunity to speak to both Tom as the person conducting the study and the other Thomas, Thomas Miller, the the director, as being the subject of the study and how the two interacted and how the writing of the book and the kind of reflexive study of the business um, changed and influenced and impacted the modes of practice and also kind of brought about a deeper understanding of their own work. So really, really interesting stuff. And it was a real privilege for me to be able to go and spend time in the fantastic studios that they've got there in this kind of gorgeous old uh, warehouse absolutely brilliant and the whole that part of the world is absolutely beautiful so you know it was a real pleasure for me to zip down from London and enjoy the afternoon with them so sit back relax and enjoy Dr Thomas Yarrow and Thomas Miller So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you were headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. I think this is quite an interesting point to start talking about the work that you've done um, and discussing, you know, kind of moving into this conversation about what is the value of the architect and what like how do we make it accessible how do we make architecture accessible what was your experience whilst doing your studies your um, of the accessibility of the architect and uh, and the value of the architect and are we able to communicate it um yeah i mean i guess i would there's probably two things i'd like to say about that the, the first is that i think uh, very much echoing what Thomas has just said, that what I observed really was the, the kind of value of um, architecture as a way of making specific reconciliations within a very complex environment full of contradictions, full of different kind of ethical frameworks, professional frameworks. Um, so, yeah, definitely would echo that strongly. I think also uh, coming as an outsider, it was really striking how, like all professions, architecture has its own terminologies, um, ways of talking, and that even insofar as you're you're constantly trying to make that open, and it's a legitimate part of the value that you bring, it does obviously it creates barriers in both in the ways you interact with other professionals and, and obviously with. Um, clients, um, 
and it was also a problem for me as an anthropologist of I also come you know with a pretty heavy um, freight of jargon and terms and things and so I think what was productive about the conversation partly was that in in each in trying to communicate beyond our kind of professional comfort zones mm. actually there was a really creative space of 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 the work of translation so what I wanted to do partly was to say um, you know if why is architecture interesting um, if you know nothing if you're not an architect you know nothing about architecture what are the sort of big bigger human resonance of it why why do architects do it what does it you know just starting with some really basic questions what does it feel like to be in an architecture mm. office what motivates people what personal stories propel and compel these um, professional working lives and once you start to do that it becomes very un ungeneric mm. I mean I think that's true more generally the sort of more specific you get the more in a sense the more general the more universal uh, are the, the resonances but but um, yes yeah, when, when when what drew you to writing this book about Thomas's practice and is it a book about Thomas's practice per se or is it a book about the architectural profession um, and, and and who like who was it for? Yeah, um, I think both. Um, so I see it as a as parochial, highly parochial, but in the most expansive sense, hopefully. So it's. it's so I think it's when a, you were trying to choose the title for the book, the, yeah. the our in the portraits of our practice, yeah, was kind of certainly discussed. Yeah. And it, is this? Is this? Yeah. Are these practices in general, or just us? Or, or, or in particular, yeah. And I, I mean, I think in a way that the tensions that you face as a practice are, are quite general, at least in the UK. It's, a, you know, all of the commercial constraints, um, the constraints that come from working with clients, the um, regulatory constraints, planning constraints. Um, I mean, but, it, was, it was an amazing process to go through, too, mm. because from our, from our perspective, like I'd record an audio diary on my way home in the car where I'd just kind of I'd just be talking to the car stereo <laughs> so it kind of just being very open and free and also other uh, people in the office recording their own audio diaries all of these getting sent to Thomas so you just record them forget about them for six months and then suddenly this kind of manuscript arrives where all of those thoughts and things that you've kind of uh, those intimate yeah. uh, descriptions that you've just kind of thought you were telling to yourself I mean, it was suddenly re sort of reflecting bigger ideas, you know, which, which, which I just, which has been an amazing process to be part of. But I, I think I'm really interested in how, or it seems like as people have been reading it and getting feedback, that what seems highly specific to us is actually being recognised by other architects who are reading it and mm. saying, actually, yeah, that really reflects what the way we work or the things that we do. I mean, I think you have a distinctive approach to dealing with those, but I think that the actual tensions are, are very general. So in that sense, I see it as a kind of very specific window or lens, but onto a much broader set of issues. So what, um, was, what was it like in terms of, because there's quite some interesting conversations in the book, particularly between some of the part ones or people mm. who were about to, to leave the practice and with uh, Thomas's father as well. Yeah. Um, were you the kind of you know the one person who was privy to all these conversations <laughs> at one point and you knew what was happening on going on because you know like an architect's office typically like we're in now is, is very quiet the work as you, you say in the book somewhere like you know it is concentrated work and it's quite engaged it's often operating in that kind of creative hemisphere of the brain which is not sort mm. of rabbiting on about mm. something how did you open that lid up and then <laughs> What were you? What was it like knowing the kind of intimate conversations? Um, well, I suppose as sort of slowly and gently as I, I could really. And um, I've always with ethnography, which is the approach I take, I try not to force the pace too much. And mm. I think it's not it's that's not on the logic of um, kind of collecting more and more data. So it took me a long time. I mean, I was here for months and months, but not really so I could gain more and more data, but so I could sort of often it was seeing the same things that were probably there on the first day but just learning to see what was too obvious or or, or too unfamiliar as well to, to actually notice it so that so there was a lot of kind of just listening in a very undirected way 
Um, but then I suppose that that did become also more interventionist as as time went on, and I was kind of then increasingly doing interviews and um, kind of you know prodding a, a bit further. And, and seeing where the points of resistance were and, and and as well because it was I really think this you know it wasn't a book I wrote about Thomas or about the practice it was a, a book I wrote with you know it's it's trying to um, start from all of those conversations and, and, and to sort of um, present them really that's mm. you know reflect them back um, and that reflection didn't just start in the writing process but it was there all along I was writing bits of text, they were going on the website, people were saying, oh, you know, you've got this wrong, this bit resonates, this is really interesting. Um, and a lot of it was trying to present stuff that I think people were already kind of aware of, but maybe just, you know, in the periphery of the vision of a very busy working life and trying to sort of elevate those moments that because your gaze is on the building rather than the process mm. but sort of to turn that around so I kind of came to see the writing as a like a mirror really it's not um, didactic it's not argumentative it's just holding up a mirror and saying mm. what do you see and I think I hope different people will see different things reflected back I, I, I think what's interesting about that too is um, we get so used to having structured presentations of our selves and our work and yeah like kind of i suppose it both internally within an office and externally you have your kind of origin story or your kind of um instagram feed website and um or even just within the office kind of structures to meetings and ways of kind of dealing with different situations so i think to have someone who's totally outside of that mm. come in and then try and notice all the spaces between those structures and kind of uh, pull out of that some of what's going on sort of under the surface is kind of... Well, I, I find it's quite scary in a way. It's yeah. kind of like... And especially the idea of all of those things being published in a book that <laughs> anyone can buy. And like, it's, um, it, it sort of I was was terrifying at, at times. Um, but I suppose it's been reassuring as kind of people have, uh, have then read it and kind of given good feedback. And how, how did you edit the process or control the process? Or were there moments where you were like, Tom, don't put that in. Like, yeah. We can't. We can't have anyone seeing that. Well, I think I think it, it has been really challenging because I think from the start we wanted to make something that was as real or as truthful to kind of how things really work as as possible. Um, and so I think we. I mean, you. We were quite quick, keen that it it wasn't edit, edited. Um, and I think there were things that I was I was kind of saying I'd kind of rather you didn't put that in, but if you have to, <laughs> you mm. do. And I think some of those things got left in, some some of them got taken out. But um, I think it's interesting. Uh, I think we're both hoping that in in be, trying to be honest about how things actually work, that other people recognise and recognise themselves in that, um, and that being interesting and valuable. I, 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 mean, I, 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 I think I think the way I would see it is that all of these are, are, are all of these may be slightly embarrassing or the things that you at least you know I don't think there's anything too damning but it, they might not be what you'd put on your website but they're all they're not um, artifacts of some failure it, they're, they're basically about these structural tensions and and the sort of impossibility of architecture as a as, as a space that's just you know, between all these things that don't neatly come together or coalesce. It's, it's been really interesting for me because, you know, after we did our uh, mm. podcast earlier on in the last, well, last year, how many architects have been fascinated by the idea of having an anthropologist come in and study mm. the profession and I'm kind of asking the question, why, is, why are people fascinated by this? What's the interest? And as from in, a, in the business context, in, in a marketing context as well, like this ability to be able to see outside of yourself and actually, you know, whenever I talk to a marketeer uh, who works with an architect, they often tell me the, the story of like, well, a lot of the times the architects have got no idea what their USP actually is or what they think 
the clients are interested in is not what the clients are interested in. The clients are actually choosing them for totally different reasons. Um, and so when we have this kind of external eye, uh, it's kind of refreshing and also like really there's a humility to it and there's a, a fascination with it and it's kind of like, oh, crack, why are you interested in that stuff? That's what we do every day. Um, but actually that's got a lot of, it's got a lot of value in it and it also, there's a lot of the, the human story is behind yeah. that as well. I think one thing I've felt reading accounts of architecture is they, they tend to bifurcate on the one hand into very celebratory accounts, you know, often of great architects and their genius and creativity. On the other hand, <laughs> um, which maybe you'd have preferred a bit in that one, um, so this isn't that. On the other hand, you've got very deconstructive um, accounts, which are basically of the kind of elite status of architects, the way they perpetuate, you know, the, the, all of the kind of critiques you're probably familiar with. And I think what I wanted to do was just to show, to open up the reality, like, like to sort of show um, how, like I was seeing and noticing people saying quite contradictory things, but that doesn't mean that that's a problem but it's just those often those tensions are productive you know people talk in this office or they did I mean this is a historical account now but five years ago when I did the research there was a lot of tension between the idea of collaboration and the idea of the sort of individual you know sticking to your guns kind of thing mm. well that's you, you know you could say that's a contradiction but actually it's not it's it's just a, a way in which design involves oscillations between different tendencies different moments um, so I think even just, I think that was one thing that you commented anyway at the time that you found quite interesting of how I was sort of saying, well, it's interesting you say this, but you also say that. And often they were quite contradictory at different times. But, but then that's not to say it's wrong. It's just to say, isn't this an interesting thing about the way the process works? Um, I suppose that's interesting in a world where everything, where things have a tendency, people want definite answers or a solution yeah. or or want those things kind of quite quickly and this was a study that took a long time to conduct of just kind of observing um, and then the conclusions are kind of inconclusive mm. and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and but I, I think they, I, I found it great that it, it's it almost gives permission to uh, just feel comfortable with some of those contradictions and I mean I think it started off you were starting to think about I think I'm right in saying about the kind of uh, contradiction of historic conservation and energy efficiency which is kind of yeah it came out of a project a funded project I had and um, I mean I did write some stuff about that but this this it quite quickly became the, the much more central interest of really just, I mean just my fascination was why why do people do this thing like you know like an classic anthropologist would do in East Africa or wherever, you know, what's going on when these <laughs> sort of strange things are happening? Why are they doing this? How does it feel? What motivates them? It's just the sort of very basic questions that I was interested in. Mm. It's also we spend so mm. much of our time at work and like I think of all the people I know, my parents or friends who do other jobs and I have no idea what they actually do. Mm when they're in those contexts and we don't we don't we don't tend to talk about you know like you tend you might talk about achievements or when other other people might talk about the buildings or things but actually talking about meetings and phone calls and site visits and like that's not something you talk about in your everyday so it's it's quite interesting having something that we spend so much of time so much of our lives doing being reflected reflected back and for other people to see. Thanks. I think actually it's particularly true or, or specifically true of, of architecture, the way that you're, you're constantly, I mean, the idea of vocation, and I know that that's in some ways often seen as problematic. Mm. It sort of justifies, you know, um, certain not very progressive working practices or can do, but um, kind of without wanting to take a hard position on that, I think it's, it's really interesting, that this idea that you... It's not just work. It's it, it folds so much into it, and it and it 
it becomes a way of seeing and perceiving the world and it's something that you can you will sacrifice for and on the other on the other side to that you know what you do you tell your story about the practice you tell your story about yourself that's a, that's a thing that is is partly a kind of marketing tool but it's also partly something you believe in uh, how because you're all what you're selling is kind of yourself in a way mm. your individuality your creativity <laughs> And so those stories about life beyond architecture are actually very integral to the professional kind of act of valid. So they're acts of validation. How, how how do you see, for example, the discussion we were having just now, for example, uh, to do with the sort of technological slant of the practice and the things that you focus on in your in your book? Why mm. did you choose to focus on the things that you chose, and why did you or more of a sort of reflexive question, like uh, how did you feel about what Thomas chose to write and w what do you think about what Thomas chooses to speak about? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think from, from my perspective, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, it's it's great that Thomas is interested in all this, these new technologies and stuff. <laughs> I think I always, this has been a theme going back to when you were 12, I think you've always been like, oh, you know, there's this new th I remember Thomas introduced me to the internet. <laughs> so I live in Chipping I lived in Chipping Norton at the time, and typed it in, Chipping Norton, look, there'll be something about it. And there was like one entry or something. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, no, this, this definitely isn't going to, this, this won't catch on. And um, you've got a smartphone now, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there's a kind of a certain, uh, I'm more of a Luddite, but I think I'm also, I'm kind of interested in the, in a way, I think there's there's a lot professionally that doesn't change that much. There's always a kind of concern with the new, and I'm sure these things will facilitate different interesting ways to work. But I think there's actually something underlying that mm. which kind of doesn't change. And so for me, the thing I wanted to foreground was this kind of the productivity of co incompatibility, the way that spaces between opposed things aren't problematic, they're productive. And whether it's software or whether it's whatever they're just you know and in five years time it would be a different so i mean the other thing is also historically when i did it it's a snapshot of the practice as it was yeah so this was when um some of the stuff with lived in was just starting to very very first um yes yeah, so you said this, this was actually done five years ago the, the research. um yes um and and a, a lot of the technologies well, they were different ones. Yeah, I, I think even so, yeah. though, I think when we started the project, I think we imagined it, uh, well, I imagined it being a bit more of a collaboration. <laughs> and, and I was kind of like, okay, this is what you're going to write about. And like, um, because this is what I'm interested in. And in a sense, as the project evolved, it became clear that that wasn't what Thomas wanted to write about. <laughs> but which I think is actually a really good thing because I, I suppose I wanted to write about something that was more about telling our story or mm. trying to construct a bit of a narrative mm. or trying to make something really interesting and it's like I mean as I kind of gradually realised Thomas was more just kind of hanging out and watching the everyday things in the office it's like oh where's like why is that interesting what, 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 what? surely I mean, I mean, all this tech stuff yeah. or some of these business ideas or how can we make the world a better place kind of like um why aren't we writing about that exciting stuff mm. and, um, but I think then getting the book back and the manuscripts back and reading them and finding all those small things that happen in an office and also well I, I suppose that big the big thing that we keep talking about with the tension the tensions that it uh, deals with is it, is it something that you give to your clients now uh, not no <laughs> <laughs> it's really I, as I said I kind of i I've, I've I've always felt a bit terrified about it being published and I now feel very comfortable to recommend it to architects. Um, I feel like I can recommend it that, to that tribe. Mm. But I still, I do still feel a bit uneasy about recommending it to, uh, I suppose especially a future client because it's like you want that glossy image of what yeah. you do, the one that's on Instagram or on your website and not the kind of gritty reality. Yes. But, but then actually I was speaking to a past client who has read it and he was saying this is this this is amazing you need to give it to all your clients because you only want you only want the clients to whom they're still attracted mm. once they've heard and that they actually want to come and work with you even more having 
having read the book. I think it's, I think those, it's a very interesting idea, though. That I mean, for me, it, it's really in fascinating this kind of idea of just observing and like just presenting a reflection and you know in the world of social media and contemporary marketing and reality tv this is something that people have a sort of just such a fascination with like we totally can't believe how you know big brother for example just streams eight hours of literally cctv footage yeah and people are glued to it um, you know, perhaps these kind of shows have evolved and they've had to spice things up and, you know, introduce competitions and games in it to mm. kind of keep it. But then now we've got, um, you know, you know, everybody can be constantly broadcasting themselves. And, you know, there is a lot of uninteresting stuff, but it's also has this huge value in it. And I'm always amazed at the things that I post on Instagram, for example, that get the most traction or interest are like, you know, me struggling to post a letter and not wanting to have to queue and getting annoyed by the queue and not being able to find the right envelope. Mm. Mm. And Well, actually, our, <laughs> our highest ever tweet was, I think, me celebrating doing a back somersault on the trampoline. And it was... <laughs> <laughs> and then, and you win awards. You yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's, it's so yeah. interesting that people really genuinely want to see what's happening. Um, I, was, I was talking to a... Uh, uh, an estate agent recently um, who sells a lot of uh, prime properties and he's been very innovative on Instagram and, you know, tells his story, his day-to-day moving in between properties and he always gives the, you know, the glamorous shots of inside this house. It's kind of, you know, everyone wants to peer inside these, mm. um, these houses. But actually, the stuff inside the office as well. And he was saying, it's been really useful because I'm kind of continually communicating with clients. I'm continually able to build a relationship with people um, without actively having to do anything as such and kind of scaling up the trust. And there's something about this transparency, and this is what's so powerful about the book, is it's very transparent, is that there's something happens when people read that. that they're like, you know, you relate to the other person, you, you, and once that relation starts to happen, there's trust. And then and you see the human side of, yes. of things. Yeah. And, and, and for you, like in, in the, some of the, the conversations, um, were they like the first times you've seen, like the example of the two, the two architectural assistants, um, when they were talking about what it was like coming out of uni and then working for a project architect and like, I'm just detailing all this stuff. What was that like, reading that kind of stuff? No, well, it's fascinating because you, you have your own view of the practice and how... And the different interests of the different parties and then you read something and realise it's a totally they've got a totally different perspective on, on what they're doing and uh, which is fantastic it, mm. it's kind of really it's really great I mean it makes it makes you really think how like I need to kind of need to acknowledge that more in my everyday mm. everyday work I mean I do think there's this lovely uh, line by Louis McNeese the poet um, soundlessly collateral and incompatible the world is crazier and more of it than we think I often think of that and I thought of it in here you know here is this really single room that actually the, these um, barriers weren't up at the, at the time so it was you could encompass it in a sense within a single gaze and yet within that um, are all these incompatibilities and um, and that's where the, 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 the possibility and the creative um, possibility of this place is, is that actually I mean yes everyone's kind of I guess there's a sort of a broad practice approach but even within that there's very very different I was, I was really struck you know talking to people how different people's experiences of the practice were how um, not in a you know not in a problematic way but just they, they don't and it's, I mean, it, it's interesting that though, isn't it? In a world where you're encouraged to tell a kind of coherent narrative mm. and uh, present yourself in a way that's easily consumed, when actually the reality of that is it's kind of different perspectives, kind of messy, yeah. kind of real, real stuff. I mean, I, I think there's that thing that I always thought that kind of running a business, you'd you do a certain amount and it would be hard work but you'd reach a plateau and then you'd be kind of coasting along and it's kind of like every day just realise that things are more nuanced and complex than you thought they were Mm. Um, which is kind of again both kind of terrifying and really exciting Um, so what's 
next for both of you? And are we allowed to talk about the project you guys are working on together? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, next thing. Yeah, uh, well, we're, we're, all right, well, we're doing... Uh, let's, uh, yeah, Thomas is a client <laughs> at the moment. Well, he's for a family house uh, up in North Wales, which is really exciting. I think one of the things we're quite excited about, we had this idea when we were uh, about 20 of, right, I think it's really either writing a book or making a film of people's, what they do at work, basically. Mm. Which is kind of strange because we didn't speak about it since then. And then this project emerged and it almost turned into that, I'm not. It's cert, I certainly wasn't. Didn't make that connection. I'm not sure if you did, but it seems like um, there seems value in that. And so we have kind of thought about like, well, are, are there any other contexts that you could kind of apply this apply this to, mm. which would be interesting. Um, I think it would also be interesting to do something that was a bit that was more collaborative. Um, uh, but, but but it's interesting. We're coming from two quite different perspectives, and yes. different disciplines, and I think I think it's what's exciting about, about the book is that it's a kind of really real merging. Of would, would you recommend every architect have an anthropologist come and visit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you'd have to know them. <laughs> no, I think yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it, actually seriously, I think it it was quite a. I mean, I guess relationships are always transforming and that's what makes them interesting. And certainly with us, we've always kind of done things. Um, but this was definitely one that kind of gave it a different tenor, I suppose, for a certain period of time. And there were times, I mean, I think it was a risk, really, because there were times when I felt quite anxious about, um, you know, I was seeing him really as a, as a subject of research, as much mm. as he was also a friend. So I'd phone him up and, you know, we would have the same conversations about, you know, our children or whatever, but also there was this sort of other relationship and I was really, I mean, always the personal relationship comes first, but I was worried about the, the kind of pressure that that was putting on it at times and actually particularly when I started writing. And, um, yeah, I mean, there was nothing like that we fell out over, but there was sort of... You know, I didn't. I, I wanted to be truthful to the story I'd seen and, and to tell it in my way. Thomas was extremely generous and, and trusting in allowing me to do that, but I, I felt that as a real kind of fear. So I, 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 in a way, feel quite like happy that I think we we got through it and <laughs> we're still sitting. We got smiles on our face, right? So I think it's all okay. Um, and I feel Absolutely. like, and I feel like I've really learned something about, um, and because his work is such a big part of him, mm. um, that I've found out things about him. Um, I'd like to come and hang out with Thomas for <laughs> a few months. And well, that, that's deconstruct that, what he does. That, that's the other question. <laughs> what did you learn about anthropology? And I mean, there's a point in the book where you're talking about, or someone was talking about removing the scaffold of. Yeah. of you know, of, of anthropology from to make it accessible. We kind yeah. of began this conversation with accessibility. Is yeah. what Thomas what, what Thomas's work is that now more accessible to you? No, I mean, and, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a bit a big intention of the project yeah. um, from a start when we were working together is I've I've always found what Thomas does a little bit inaccessible because of the kind of some of the language or the rigor kind of and academic references. Mm. Um, and I really love the ideas, and I love what Thomas kind of thinks about, but don't don't think it always it, it, I've always felt that his ideas don't need that that rigorous academic referencing mm. in order to stand up so we were so we were quite i think we're quite keen in the book of, about being an experiment in how how you could write a book that was both kind of stood up within the academic context but was also very accessible to someone who doesn't live in that world yeah um and i think we 
I mean, it absolutely came out of, you know, some of the first drafts I was writing and the bits I thought were, you know, really good, great and, you know, that were really hitting the nail on the head. And I think it was Tom Howard who said it was like I'd built a building and left the scaffolding on and he was talking about all these kind of technical terms and the, just even the referencing, the brackets, the stuff that makes text look like a piece of academic writing, which it yeah. was. And, it, and so it was really, that was the kind of, so initially I was thinking it would just be a kind of academic conventional academic monograph of which I've you know written a number and it was actually that stimulus of thinking actually no if I imagine that the audience is architects and even potentially broader you know what what would that book then look like and um and in some ways it's I found it more challenging I mean it definitely wasn't a question of dumbing down it would because it then made me interrogate my own concepts you know all these sort of terms that trip off the tongue easily mm. materiality agency you know, those kind of and there was but I was thinking well if I can't do that then what do I have to explain so I think for both of us the the, the, the act of translation was a was a was a productive mm. one it, it, it made us it wasn't dumbing down it was almost the opposite of that was questioning. Um, so I, I learned a lot, and I mean, I, this is a kind of approach I'm really keen to push further with. But I guess, as perhaps in architecture, there's a tension in that the things that get recognised within the profession aren't necessarily the things that translate beyond it. So for me, I'm writing within a context of research audit where things are assessed, have to be assessed every four or five years, yeah. are graded according to a certain kind of disciplinary expectation. Mm. So that was the kind of balance with this book was I couldn't really justify spending you know a year or whatever writing it and then for it to have no currency. And yeah, any of the and so waiting. I think it's a it's a broader it's a broader tension in anthropology and I think it's a broader tension in professions of all kinds really of how those sort of internal languages which are enabling I mean I'm not saying that those jargon often is there for a reason it has a mm. gives something a rigor it, it it allows you to see in a certain way but they can become quite self-serving both in architecture and in anthropology and so I think that's why I think the disruption of having to move beyond it can actually move you back to it in a, in a kind of different and interesting way so I felt I found out a lot about anthropology through taking those concepts and trying to push them out into something different um, and I think for yeah. us the rigour of that academic process of taking stripping away our own narratives and our own scaffolds that we've kind of built up around what we um, how we present ourselves mm. and trying to strip it back to kind of the relationships in the background of that is a really has been yeah it's been really interesting brilliant i think that's a, i think that's a good place for us to to stop so thank you guys so much for having me here today and thank you to, for sharing your experiences and your expertise and your insights and that's a wrap thank you so much for listening and don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.